Uh, how are you guys doing? Uh, this is uh, David Barron. I'm uh, I'm also known as uh, this other guy, Dantalian Jones. Uh, every Saturday about this time, I try to invite as many people as I can to join me for uh, Facebook Live. Facebook Live question and answer. And uh, ideally, I will try and share this also on uh, my YouTube channel. Um, I have some questions that sort of came to me that I wanted to answer. And so, again, if those of you who don't know me, I've been doing hypnosis for nearly 20 years. I started uh, New Hampshire hypnosis in 2010. I started Eastern Oregon hypnosis in 2016, and I'm actually operating two hypnosis practices. Uh, on, in addition to that, uh, uh, I'm writing some books. I'm writing some books on advanced hypnosis as well. And I sincerely try every week to come here for up to an hour to basically answer questions, talk about hypnosis. It is, uh, yes, you know, it is just basically a talking head. Um, type of um, presentation. So I, I hope you will bear with me. And I did make an attempt to try to invite uh, as many people, at least tag them. I'm not entirely sure if that worked as well as I wanted it to. Uh, but uh, I'm giving it a try. And if you know anyone who you can share this with, please do. Um, what I wanted to sort of start off with is uh, there are a couple things I had. To, I want to thank someone who is in this group. Incidentally, uh, I like wearing this hat. I don't know if it works well on this video or not, but if you want to comment and say hat off or hat on, uh, I'd love to know. Um, I did get a referral from, I think from this group actually, uh, from someone who sent me uh, there, it was a fellow who wanted me to work with his son for drug addiction. Now, first of all, thank you very much for sending me a, a referral. Um, it is someone I would have to work with uh, remotely through internet, uh, through Skype and teleconferencing. Uh, and they gave me some basic questions that I think are important, that at least I can answer based on my experience about drug addiction and using hypnosis to deal with drug addiction. First of all, I'm not going to ever say cure. Uh, for, first of all, diseases, uh, doctors cure disease. Uh, that would violate some medical, um, put me under the, the uh, auspices of medicine. And I'm not really so much a, med uh, a, uh, a physician. I'm not a physician at all. What I try and do is I simply try and help people. With regard to drug use, uh, I have had experience working with clients who are drug addicted, who are trying to remove themselves from drug addiction. Now, it, in, in a lot of ways, it is just like tobacco. It is just like the cravings that they have for tobacco. But in a lot of, a lot of ways, it is not. It's often much more per pervasive. So as a result, I am very cautious when I am when I am working with somebody and inviting them to work with me, and their problem is drug use. A couple of things I I do look for quite sincerely is I want them to be very sincere about their interest in quitting in quitting drugs. So ideally, but uh, I'll be asking them I'll be asking them how many times they've tried to quit, how sincere are they. If it is someone who has just been sent to me by their parents or their counselor, I'm still going to vet them. And I'm going to let them know that I am hesitant to take on drug use because it is such, such a pernicious and devious type of uh, disease. Now, ideally, when that happens, uh, it, it my my goal is to make sure their motivation is up. Now my experiences with drug use 
when I work with somebody, I can usually, I can almost consistently get a very positive result so that at the end of the session, regardless of whether it is tobacco or drugs, at the end of the session, I can pretty much ensure they cannot, they do not have a craving, they cannot even bring up a craving for whatever their weakness is, uh, drugs, alcohol, tobacco, it's just not there. Now, I, I tell them that I've given them a resource, I basically have them practice an emotional state or create an emotional state that has a great deal of resources that I want them to practice bringing about. Now, I fully know that life is complicated and drug, the life of someone who is drug addicted is, uh, is dynamic and there are triggers all around. They usually have friends and there are things that can happen in their environment that will potentially re-trigger the craving. Now, a lot of times when I've done this, there is no problem from the first session on. But there, is, there are as many times where I've worked with somebody where they have success. They have success for three or four days, and then something happens. Uh, they either have a craving or they meet with an old friend who's using the drugs. And again, it, they get triggered. And the craving comes up and they yield to it. In every case, when that happens, it is simply an event. I deal with it just as I would. Uh, it's something from which we can learn and we build on it. Typically, if I have to see someone several times for drug use, it still works. In the long run, they end up getting the resources so that they can respond to the triggers in the situations and the cravings that used to trigger uh, a drug craving. So. That's sort of my question, or my answer to my question is, can hypnosis be used for drugs? Yes, it's an incredible tool. The, the fellow I talked with, he called me, uh, he was actually in San Diego, and he, uh, and again, someone from the group here referred him to me. He wanted to know if he was, should fly up here and I should work with his son. And my, my question is, first of all, that that's, you really care about your son a lot, but it's not necessary simply because if I'm going to work with somebody for drug addiction, I want them in the environment in which they are triggered so that if we can build a strength, a resource to respond to those sorts of cravings, those triggers, those things, in the environment, then they'll be in the environment where they won't come up where they will be able to practice this new strength and resource that we do uh, through the hypnosis. Um, Another thing I wanted to, uh, I mentioned, and I mentioned it in a video earlier, which is uh, something I recently experienced that I thought was very interesting. It is, um, it is an ab reaction during the induction. Now, I've been doing hypnosis for nigh on 20 years now. This is not something that is common. I have not, I'm sure, I can remember three or four times when I've done an induction and someone freaks out. There are probably more, but there's only like two or three that I really remember. And now typically what happens, you'll be doing induction. It could be an eye lock induction where their eyes are sealed shut and they will try to open their eyes and they freak out. They panic because they feel out of control. Now, what I found is there are a couple ways to deal with it. Typically, someone else is just going to try a different induction or not do something that's just as dramatic. And I'm sure those will work. Uh, ideally, if that ever were to happen, my advice is to do what my friend and my mentor, Jeff Stevens, says, which is don't worry about it. Don't care. Don't let it phase you. Just do something different. Now, what I have found if someone tends to respond that dramatically with an ab reaction to a, a hypnotic induction. It's just, it's just so very simple. Don't do the induction. Instead, do symbology. And the symbology process, um, I, I do have this on the Mind Control Publishing website. 
This is Jeff Stevens' description of the symbology process. It works incredibly well. And basically what it is, it's an imagination exercise where you symbolize, you ask the subconscious mind to create a symbol for the process or for the problem rather. And then you ask the subconscious mind to change the symbol into whatever the positive resource would be. Now all these would be determined prior to the discussion, uh, prior to the actual doing the symbology process. But the nice part about the symbology process is it does not need an induction. Now I use it in the middle of hypnosis, so I, there is almost always an induction prior to using the symbology process that just sort of makes the process more significant and more profound. But if someone abreacts, if someone freaks out because the induction is too weird for them, if, they have, if it's too dramatic, if it's um, uncomfortable, just let them know it's no problem. We're going to do something different. And I just say, close your eyes and ask your subconscious mind to make a symbol that represents this problem. And then you go right into the symbology process. Any of you who want to learn the symbology process, I'm, of course, naturally, I'm going to tell you, order this from Mind Control Publishing. But, you know, I know what it's like to be a cheap bastard. You can find out about the process just as easily by researching it and you can find demonstrations of it on YouTube. They are not as good a description as what Jeff Stevens offers in, in this DVD, but they're enough. And uh, I, I use a very, um, I use a variation of that uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in all of, almost all of my hypnosis processes. Oh, hey, thanks for the thumbs up, I appreciate it. Um, now, something else uh, led to that, it again was a comment that was uh, in my post about an ab reaction, which is um, someone was in a hypnosis seminar where they did past life regressions. And in during the seminar, someone ex went into what they assumed was a past life and started to experience trauma, pain, torture, and ultimately death and began to freak out. Now that's not, that's, you know, completely understandable. I certainly wouldn't blame anybody if in hypnosis they started to experience uh, something that really freaked them out. The, um, what I would, first of all, I have a couple of things I'd like to say about that. I have done past life regression. I know how to do it. I personally have no theory as to whether it's real or not. For me as a hypnotist, my concern is get the result. So if they ask, they tell you they have a problem, they tell you what kind of result they want, give them that result. They want to be free of a craving, great give them that result. And it doesn't matter if you use past life regression or not. Now, past life regression, I've noticed, can give a very significant result. And it, who knows? It could be because there are past lives and we carry that crap with us. It could just as easily be that those things we think of as past lives are, in fact, just uh, symbols of our problem doesn't matter as long as you get the result. Now, I do have an issue with bringing someone to a state in hypnosis where they have an ab reaction. And then, like, you know, going to a past life where you're being tortured and, and, and ultimately murdered and panicking, yeah, that'll bring about an ab reaction. People are going to panic, they're going to start breathing hard, they're going to start crying and shaking and wanting the hell out of there. I personally do not like that. <laughs> I do not feel you have to bring someone into a trauma in order to heal it. So for that reason, I sort of object to that. 
it simply isn't necessary. I have the very same strong issues with people going back to initial sensitizing events. Uh, in, in that case, it's a regression to an event that caused a trauma that has a long lasting effect. Now, I have done those too, and I've gotten really good results. But in regression to sensitizing events, you bring them back to that very, very uncomfortable, painful, traumatic state, and then they experience it. And then they, you ask them to reevaluate their response and learn something from it. Well, they get a result, but you don't need to traumatize somebody. You don't need to dip them in a pool of boiling oil in order to heal them. Uh, so, and again, the best ways to do that, the symbology process is a great way of doing that. Also, uh, the, uh, oh, here we go. In, in the uh, training program that uh, Jeff Stevens uh, teaches uh, that uses this book, it too uses what's called the golden box. It is where you ask the subconscious mind to make very meaningful, simple, and significant changes, and then you get then you get a confirmation from the subconscious mind. And when it works, it works, and it doesn't require returning back to a traumatic event. So all of this is done in what is called um, non-specific or uh, a dissociated state, you're not associated into pain. Uh, and, I, and that's also gonna help you in so many other ways. If you have to bring someone back to a traumatic event, they're going to in some way associate that trauma to you. And if you have not dealt with it to their satisfaction, to their absolute joy, then you run the risk of you know, all the things that are unpleasant, like being sued, being called names, getting bad reviews, um, things like that. So I, I highly recommend that if you wanna be really good at helping people without bringing them to traumatic events in their lives through hypnosis. Use the, the Jeff Stevens method. It's, it's a simple 10 step method. And also understand the symbology process. Uh, so I hope that addresses uh, some, some questions about past life regression. If, uh, if there are any questions here, I would certainly, uh, certainly love to answer them. Also, um, a couple of questions. Uh, a couple of questions came about uh, about anchoring when you're doing conversational hypnosis. Now, I want to sort of divide that into a couple of different a couple of different uh, contexts. Some people say conversational hypnosis, and they're talking about doing it for persuasion or for picking up girls or uh, influence or sales. Okay, that is, those are all legitimate ways of using conversational hypnosis. And then there's the conversational hypnosis that you're using it to actually help somebody who is paying for you. And anchors, when doing anchors, it's relatively straightforward. You, to, you first have to develop the anchor. In, I mean, I'm going to give you the theory. You're going to have to go out and actually do it. So I'm doing the easy stuff. You got to go out and, and practice it. The easy stuff is you're talking to them. You start talking about an emotional state that you want them to have. It could be a state of eagerness. It could be a state of anticipation. It could be a state of having done something they wish they would, could go back and do, a, a, a state of not wanting to regret their actions. So you talk about that and you ask them to, to describe their experience of it. When they are describing it, you observe them, you look at them, and you have to evaluate if they are in that state or not. To set the anchor, you have you do a gesture often it is it can be a physical gesture moving in a certain direction 
but just as easily it's you looking at them, making eye contact, and touching them, say, on the shoulder or on the elbow, but in a way that is unique so that someone else is not likely to very easily do the same gesture and bring about the result. There will be, ideally, when you're setting this anchor, uh, two things that are unique to the situation. The first is, as they're feeling this feeling, they're looking at you, that's one. And the second is the touch, the setting of the anchor that you're doing. So it's when you're present and when you touch them in that way that that feeling would come about. So you, so again, setting the anchor, straightforward. You talk about the emotion, the response. You ask them to describe their memories of having that feeling. When you see that they're having that emotion, you touch them in that unique way. Okay, so the anchor is now set. If you wanna do it two or three times, that works great. Now, you have the opportunity to fire the anchor and firing the anchor is repeating the response to bring back the emotion. So if you want them to feel a sense of eagerness, a sense of anticipation, a sense of really going for it, you have set that anchor. You talk about, you know, when you're just ready to do something, when you see a $10 bill or a $20 bill, just start to blow by your feet and you run for it. You set the anchor. You do that enough time. Now you want to talk about them want having an opportunity to do something. That's something that you want them to do, that you're enlisting them to do. And in that case, when you're talking about it, you fire that anchor and bring up that emotion. Now, again, I'm just giving you the theory. You have to go out and you have to practice it. Sometimes the result is gonna be very dramatic. If you've done it well, if you're doing this, you know, conversationally or covertly, they may not notice it. They'll just feel, they, they, they will probably not notice the anchor, but they will feel the emotion come up and you'll notice it that way. Don't second guess yourself, just observe. Now that's in the covert, the, uh, the covert form of conversational hypnosis. If you're doing conversational hypnosis to help somebody, it's a little, it's a little easier. Uh, you will do the exact same steps, but you're going to involve them much more in the conversation. You're going to let them let the conversation be about when you're when you're trying to set the anchor, say the positive emotion, you want to set the anchor. You're going to let them know the conversation is about this feeling. You talk about the feeling, you have them describe the feeling, you have them remember the feeling and, and talk about the memory of the feeling. And then you set the anchor. And you do that enough times, two, three times maybe, so that you're pretty confident when you do that, when you fire that anchor, the, the feeling's gonna come about. Okay, and then you go into the therapeutic part where you're talking about how they should respond, how they wanna respond in the ideal situation with this feeling, and then you fire the anchor. And again, it should be fairly straightforward. I would recommend, because this is about getting results, you do it enough so that they just begin to notice it happening automatically. You don't ever have to fire the anchor. So again, you would test it every time. Again, as, as a hypnotist, for me, people don't come to me and pay for sessions and they don't pay for hypnosis. They pay for a result. They want to get rid of a craving. They want to make a change in their life. They want to feel more confident or get rid of stress and post-traumatic stress and anxiety. They want a result. So that's what they are paying for. Just please remember that. Okay. Uh, if there, uh, so if you have any questions about anchors, please post them. Now I have a, a another topic which I actually have had a lot of fun with. It's about directly talking to the subconscious mind. Um, in another, let's see, there is another uh, book that, uh, DVD that Jeff Stevens has called Real Self Change. And it, it too is on uh, the Mind Control Publishing website. It describes things you can do 
on yourself to make positive and dramatic change at the subconscious level. He talks one of, about one of those called the, the 3D holographic mind technique. And it is a technique in which you use your imagination and imagine yourself with a client. And you go through all the detailed behaviors with this imaginary client, except the client is you. You hallucinate yourself going into hypnosis as you talk to yourself and you give them the change. Uh, and you do it just like any other hypnosis session, except you are imagining that you are hip hypnotizing this other person who is you. Now, in that, you're, you're talking to the subconscious mind. I, I thought of a couple different uh, techniques uh, that I find very amusing, and I, I suspect you'll find them rather funny, that work incredibly well. Keep in mind, the subconscious mind is often referred to as a very intelligent 10-year-old child. Now, how would you talk to a 10-year-old child so that they would want to do what you say? Not so that they would have to do it, so they would feel badgered into it, but so that they would want to do what you say. Well, you do it. It's very simple. You acknowledge them. You give them credit. You give them appreciation. You show them and tell them and demonstrate to them how much you value them. And then you ask them to do this. So here's an example. Okay. Uh, it's a little uh, self-revealing. Uh, so it is something I have used to really amazing effect. And it's uh, basically, I have had a habit of getting up four or five times a night to pee in the middle of the night. Now, I don't have any problem going back to sleep. It doesn't disrupt my sleep. It would just be nice if I didn't have to do it that many times. So I just had a little conversation with myself actually with my subconscious mind. And the conversation uh, went like this. I, when I reflect on it, I find it really amusing. What I say is, subconscious mind, I really appreciate everything that you are doing. I, and, you know, I appreciate the fact that you are operating systems in my body that I, I would not even handle. And I am so grateful that you're doing it. I know I deeply appreciate the fact that you are operating my entire urinary tract. You are making the kidneys work and, and processing all the excess fluids and taking, filtering out all that stuff so that I can urinate and pee. And you're doing a bang up job. And I just want to let you know that when I go to sleep at night, you can rest. You can just, I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to keep processing all of that stuff while I'm sleeping. So when I sleep, I'm just, I'm just asking you, just go ahead and rest. Just take a break. It's okay. You know, if, if I have to get up twice a night to pee, that's fine. And if I have to get up once a night, that's great too. I'm just saying from now on, every time that you go to, that I go to sleep, you can just rest. You can just put that side, that part of you aside. You don't have to work it. And when I wake up, just go gangbusters. Do exactly what you do so well. And I really appreciate it. Again, thank you so much for everything you do. Okay. Okay. Now that is the actual conversation that I have with my subconscious mind. And, and it is, you know, I will either say it uh, to myself or imagine this conversation going on there as if I'm talking to this part. And I just say it until I realize I would absolutely help this guy asking in this way. <laughs> so if you're gonna make a change at the subconscious level, say for example, you, 
Okay, you maybe have a public speech. You're feeling nervous. You know that nervousness is not really what is going to help you. But you know your subconscious mind is trying to protect you by bringing up this anxiety and this fear. And so you start off, you say, subconscious mind, you, you've always been there to help me. Everything you do is there for my best interest. And I know you're here to protect me. I, I really appreciate that. And I know that up to now, you know, when I think about doing a public speech, you, you sort of bring up the threat response. And I'm not blaming you. You have reasons for doing that. But I'm just letting you know, you have done so well. And you know that I'm going to be okay. You know that there really is no reason for me to feel as anxious as I used to feel. So starting now, whenever I think about giving that speech or that presentation, you know, honestly, it's going to be okay. Just you don't have to bring up that anxiety. And, and really, I thank you. Thank you so much for all the stuff that you do to me and for me. Okay, consider how you talk to your subconscious mind. These types of conversations are, are just fun to have with yourself. And I am fairly confident, I'm fairly confident that if you really practice this conversation, uh, you're gonna start noticing some incredibly dramatic changes. I think one of the things that you'll also notice is all of those incredible things that you are grateful for that just happen automatically. Your subconscious mind right, tells you to get up. It reminds you all the things you have to do. And even though you're tired, right, you get up without even thinking about it. Or um, your subconscious mind reminds you, you know, that you need to drink some water. And so you go out and have some water. And as you notice these things that just happen automatically that are there and benefit Show the gratitude. I tell my clients, once we make a really dramatic change after any session, I let them know that it isn't something they should have to work at. It is something they can make happen very easily and more often just by noticing when it happens. Just thank your subconscious mind. You know, if you, if you think about when you used to have a cigarette and there's no craving there and you just really appreciate it and you just tell your subconscious mind thank you it learns it wants to do it more so uh, this whole little process that i've done has made some really positive uh, <laughs> positive effects in my life and, and i see it in the people that i work with as well so uh, i would love to hear the kind of response you have when you talk to your subconscious mind in that way Remember, no one likes to be badgered or forced or coerced or cursed into doing something. It's usually doing something for its own reason. And it's for a reason that it thinks is the right reason. All you have to do is acknowledge it, give it appreciation, acceptance, understanding, and then ask it to make a change. And then show your gratitude again for it being there. Pretty much your subconscious mind, once it really gets the process, will start making these changes for you. Okay, so I have pretty much tapped out all of the topics that I wanted to cover today. Uh, I am going to uh, make this available. Please listen to it from start to finish. If it is a little grainy uh, from the start, yeah, that happens. Um, I'm sorry about that. That tends to happen because of the uh, the compression but if you watch it if you're watching it a second time uh, as a recording it usually uh, processes out and the, and the uh, compression works to, uh, filters itself out so it's visible if you have any questions if you have any topics you want me to discuss i'm always going to try and be here on a saturday about this time um, under the right circumstances i am not certain i'm going to be I, I certainly will not be here on March the 10th, which is a week from today. But, but uh, please post your topics, questions. I, I am more than happy to, uh, uh, to answer them. And uh, just as a favor, 
please go to mindcontrolpublishing.com. If there's something there you like or have questions about, let me know. Thank you very much. Got any questions? Talk to you very soon. Bye.